Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 140, and I recorded this episode in Los Angeles, California, uh, when I was there a couple months ago. I sat down with the extraordinary Hannah Fraser. She is a real life mermaid. What does that mean? That means she can hold her breath a really long time. She designs incredibly gorgeous mermaid tails and wears them and swims deep in the water, sometimes not so deep in the water, both both ways, and uh, swims around with manta rays and dolphins and and whales and sharks and oh my god, it's incredible. And she was very kind to take time out of her very busy schedule to sit and talk with me. She's a conservationist. Uh, She was part of the documentary The Cove. And um, gosh, she's just fascinating. Uh, Beautiful. Her design, the tales that she makes are gorgeous. I just, it was a delight to get to meet her. I learned a lot. Um, It was just fun. I mean, it's not every day you sit down and talk to a mermaid. Um, usual stuff, of course. Hey Human Podcast is all over the social media at uh, Facebook and on uh, Instagram. Uh, you can find me on Twitter under Susan Ruthism, as well as Facebook and Instagram under Susan Ruthism. You can email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. You can go to heyhumanpodcast.com and see all the links that I put up for every episode. Hannah's episode is no different. Uh, There's a ton of information that she gives. And so there are a lot of links um, on the links page there at heyhumanpodcast.com. If you shop Amazon, please do so through the Amazon portal on the heyhumanpodcast.com front page. That helps support Hey Human and helps keep it ad-free. Another way to support Hey Human is through the support button that is on the main page of heyhumanpodcast.com. Every little bit helps, and I appreciate it. You can also check out other stuff I do at susanruth.com, which is mostly my music website. And don't forget, I have music on iTunes if you are into music and you want to check that out. You can find me under Susan Ruth on iTunes. And speaking of iTunes, uh, please rate and review Hey Human Podcast on iTunes. Uh, Y'all have been given some really great reviews, and it means a lot to me. Um, And of course, it helps push the uh, podcast up through the ranks. So I know you hear that every single time, every episode, but that's part of the, the deal, I guess, is you have to mix the business with the pleasure. On to the pleasure was a huge pleasure, as I said, to speak with Hannah Fraser. I'm really excited for this episode. Thank you for listening. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Hannah Fraser, Hannah Mermaid, welcome to Hey Human. Hey Human, or yay! Hey Mermaid. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> welcome we... to Hey Hey Mermaid. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, can't be too humanist here. We... No, we had to incorporate everything and everyone. All Thank the you. fantasy creatures. Yes. Yeah. Although it's funny, I I watched some of the videos that you've done and I don't know how fantasy it really is. To me it seems very grounded in reality. That's yeah, it's nice to hear because for me it was truly about bringing my dreams into reality and making it very grounded. Mm. I'm not trying to be like something that doesn't exist. I'm trying to create a new way of being in this reality, which includes being able to hold my breath for a really long time, to be able to make fully functional, usable, but gloriously beautiful tales that I can swim around in that like are give me my superpower. But you know, nothing in my videos is CGI. It's all 100% real They're animal beautiful. interaction in Ugh. the ocean. So yeah, it's true. It's it's not a fantasy. It's it's my reality. Yeah. So let's go backwards a little bit. <laughs> um, you as a little girl, were you always drawn to water, or was it particularly mermaids? You know, how did that? I, I'm gonna. I, it, it starts with a fetishization in a way, right? You you get into something. Like for example, when I was little, I loved flamingos. 
I don't know, flamingos? Flamingos or flamencos? Yeah, so I, so I just realized as that came around my mouth, I'm like, not the dancer. Although a flamingo that does flamenco. Oh, now you're talking. I would like to see that. Right? <laughs> I'm seeing it in my head already. I know, that'd be amazing. Um, <laughs> flamingos. Uh, so how did that all begin for you? Are you a professional flamingo now? I am. <laughs> in my <Awesome>. mind. <laughs> that I gotta say. That'd be a good job, too. I'm so right? tall. Yeah. You're the one with the pink hair, though. So. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, as a kid, I was obsessed by mermaids from as early as I could remember. When I was drawing stick figures, they had mermaid tails. Really? My mom used to tell me fairy stories, I would say, more than mermaid stories. Um, but I always drew pictures of them. I, I loved the whole, like, long hair and floaty, weightless beautifulness, the underwater world, all the sea creatures. Mm -hmm. And when I was nine years old, I... Um, made my first tail after seeing the film Splash with Daryl Hannah, who Love absolutely nailed it. Such a good she movie. made. She was the first one who really made it real. Mm. Um, and yeah, for me, I was just like, that is everything I want to do. And I made my first tail out of a plastic orange tablecloth material and hand painted, painstakingly tiny little golden scales all over it. It was totally non-functional. The thing had pillow stuffing in the end of it and did more to drown me than to actually allow me to swim well. But it was a good sink or swim moment. And I guess that was, you know, my first way of learning how to navigate challenging things underwater and still survive. Please tell me you still have that. Tail. I wish I did. I wore it so well and so often it disintegrated. Yeah. We patched it back together, but it started to look really bad. And, you know, we, we moved house so many times throughout my childhood. We've lived in multiple countries. So I remember my mom dragging the thing around for a while, but it, it was sad. It was never going to get worn again. And I do have photos, though. So. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. So you, you grew up in Australia, but you when you say you moved around a lot I, within Australia? I actually was born in England oh, to okay. an English father. Yes. My Australian mother was a traveling, wandering adventurer. And so I was born in England. Then when I was one and a half, we moved to Los Angeles, where I grew up for the first seven years of my life. Mm -hmm. Then we spent a year in India. And then we moved to Australia when I was like nine years old. Mm -hmm. And then moved around a lot through Melbourne and then all the way up to Byron Bay where I, that was my first place that I chose as an adult. That's where I want to live. And it was subtropical, gorgeous paradise. Lots of water. Lots of water. And that was the first time I actually lived by an ocean. And I was 21 by the time that happened. And I didn't even grow up living with any pools. Once or twice when I was a kid for very short brief moments, we lived somewhere that had a pool, but I did not have that ocean lifestyle. So God only knows how I managed to end up being a mermaid. Did you practice holding your breath in the bathtub or something? How did you develop that, that skill? Uh, whenever I went to friends' houses, I was in the pool. When we had a pool, when I was about nine for a year, I was in it incessantly. And I was just always saying, everybody throw things in the pool, I'll go and get them. Look at me, I'm having my own tea party underwater. Look at how, how long I can hold my breath. And it was weird because my dad doesn't didn't swim at all. My mom's good, but she didn't have like an overly, you know, penchant for being in the water all the time and my sister was like whatever mm. um so it was really something that just was mine and I was really into it and just a natural little fish in the water how long can you hold your breath now uh a static breath hold I've gotten over five minutes and then moving around in the water it's usually around two minutes that's extraordinary it's, um, I mean, the world, the, no, the world record is 20 minutes static breath hold, or 22 now, I can't remember, but held by a woman. Of course. Yeah, of course. Because we hold our breath all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Although we say we're not Suck going to. Suck it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That just, that seems like an inordinate amount of time. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Five minutes is definitely long enough for me. I wish I could do active five minutes mm. yeah mm -hmm. so when you have to do that stuff do you um do you get air through a little tube and then get back in the action it depends what we're doing so for instance swimming with whales you have to move really fast through the water you're not staying still there's no way that someone could kind of come bring you air when you're doing that so it's free diving with an animal like that um, Does the animal know? Because whales are so smart. Do they kind of go, wait a minute, this is not congruent exactly with what I'm used to? What they're used to is seeing lots of free divers mm. 
jumping in and paddling around and splashing and everything and mm -hmm. they're curious interactive animals and to the degree that there's actually mothers who will bring their baby whales and showcase them to humans like here come and meet my baby and have a play it's extraordinary considering so we've cool. decimated their species mm -hmm. for hundreds of years mm -hmm. i don't understand but i'm really glad that they you know choose to forgive us and still interact with us um, I think that when I have my mermaid tail on and I can keep up with them a little bit more, I can go underneath the water and they're used to seeing people splashing around up top. And if I don't make too much big splashes, they seem to be more accepting of my presence. Um, dolphins are interesting because they kind of get freaked out by my big fin if I move it around too much, even oh. though they like the fact that I can kind of keep up and play with them a little bit. If I start doing big fin movements, they're like, what is that? That looks dangerous. Or it's like flicks, you know, mm -hmm. too much Does movement. Does it maybe remind them of a predator or something? Or, uh, yeah, I think it's just, just like out. a big lot of movement and yeah. a lot of color. Yeah. And they're just like wary. Yeah. What is that? They see color? I believe so. That's cool. I don't actually know that. Uh, well, um, I think their eyes are pretty advanced. What's that like to interact with a whale? That oh, seems... Whales best so um i'll tell you my first whale experience i'm swimming out in the deep deep blue and looking down into endless depths and i can see the sunlight rays going down into infinity and i can hear the whales singing but i don't know where they are and finally i see this shape small getting bigger 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 underneath me until it's this ginormous whale and that's when I started to get scared. I thought, holy crap, I'm so small. I've never in encountered feeling so small in my life before because we don't meet animals that are the size of buses very often. And, uh, and then I thought, oh, I'm just going to get hit by its tail or it's, I'm going to fall into its blowhole or it just will like smack me and won't even know I'm there. I'm an ant. I'm insignificant. But then I realized that it was completely aware of my size, the distance between us, even down to the amount of water that it displaced with its body and its tail movements. It knew how it was interacting with me and it came up. So there was the mother and an escort and a baby and I could hear the whale song and it was so loud. It was like having a speaker stack of music at a concert blowing right through you and the, the deep sounds were like these crazy big thunderstorm rolls and then the high-pitched squeals were like little trumpets in my ears it was so phenomenal and the feeling that came along with it was something I still struggle to explain but it was profound and it was intelligent and it was like there was information being downloaded to me but I didn't know what it was mm, and when I shivers. yeah when I came back out of the water, I was just crying. I just felt like I will put my life on the line for these animals. And that was a really formative moment in knowing that I was here to do something bigger than just enjoy swimming around in a mermaid tail. It was all about being a bridge between humans and animals and nature and, and bringing the message that they're, they're precious and we need to look after them. Explain what an escort for, what does that mean? So a whale, um, when she mates, she has these male escorts that follow her around and then, you know, one of them will get to mate with her and he becomes her escort. And that's why they're called escorts. Ah. <laughs> Do they mate for life? No, they no. don't. They mate once a season. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. May the best whale win. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. They have these wild mating runs where the males will to push away other males they will do all these huge bubbles and and like make a wall of bubbles between them and the the female that i saw one once in tonga it was fascinating that's so cool it's like behemoths making massive bubble walls what's it like interacting with a whale baby oh they're so cute and so playful and i had one experience where it seemed like the movements that i was making the baby was following me and making the same movements with its fins as uh, like I was doing with my arms. It was really cool. And they'll come and look at you and check you out and you can just look straight into their eyes, which are like the size of your head. It's, it's crazy. Intimidating and beautiful and amazing. And you realize that they don't mean any harm to anyone. Yeah. Yeah. And ancient. 
ancient. So, oh God, these animals have been around forever. Yeah. And also, sharks are one of the oldest creatures on this planet, and interacting with them is wild. So what's that like? It's different. It's very different to whales. They have a very, um, like, they're wary predators, and depends also each different shark has got its own personality and also within its own species, you know, they have different, and even within the species, different areas around the world have different types of tiger sharks that interact differently. Like I would not swim with tiger sharks off the coast of Australia. They're known to be pretty vicious. And then the tiger sharks in the Bahamas are way more chill, much more acclimatized to meeting humans. You can go and pet them. You know, it's, it's an entirely different thing. So with sharks, you just really have to go with people that have interacted with them a lot before that understand all of their behavior. Um, you have to be able to pick up on the nuance of the way that they move and know their behavioral customs before you can safely interact with them. Whereas anyone can jump in the water and be with a whale and be very safe. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a lot of research on the tiger sharks in the Bahamas before I went and swam with them. Talked to all the experts, went with um, Jim Abernethy and his shark tours. have been doing it for 20 years or something. He knows all those sharks by name. He actually named one of them after me. A new shark turned up and interacted with me, and he named it Hannah Aww. afterwards. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but they're beautiful. Uh, I kind of got the sense that they were like a pack of big old hound dogs because they can sniff... Um, the scent of food along the bottom of the ocean and they will kind of follow the track and you can see them. They look like they're nearly just kind of sniffing along the bottom and they look up at you with these, you know, funny little eyes and you realize once you start scratching them on the head that they're kind of into the affection and strangely out of all the animals in the ocean, tiger sharks are the only ones that came to me for physical attention and it, we weren't feeding them and they just kept coming back and, and seemed to enjoy being tickled on the nose, which I wouldn't suggest everybody goes out and does that. But sure. it's it's a pretty phenomenal experience to have this huge beast that we consider to be like these men, hungry animals that just want to kill us, come up and want to just have a tickle. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, human beings come up with all sorts of reasons to justify their abuse of power so true you know (laughs) we are really the only very dangerous animal on this planet yeah we're certainly the top 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 predator for Mm -hmm. sure absolutely um so you're a little kid and you've begun this this madcap adventure when did you cross into the idea of of this is going to now be my voice because it's different to be like you know uh this is important to me and I talk about it and I'm learning about it, but then to know that this was your calling for sure. Yeah. So as a kid, um, you know, I only managed to swim around for about six months to a year in that tail before it disintegrated. And then I moved to somewhere that had no pools and no ocean and it just was cold and there was no real inspiration to continue that journey. And so I continued it in my art form. So I would draw pictures of mermaids and I started, um, when I finished school, I started a business creating my art into paper products like greeting cards and stickers and illustrations. And um, yeah, I did all sorts of jobs for people creating fantasy work of fairies Mm -hmm. and mermaids and dragons and things like that. And so I would just kind of live in my head in this fantasy of the mermaid world. And it wasn't until I got hired for a... I got a, went to a casting for an underwater shoot and I got the job against all these other girls because I could hold my breath for a long time and I was really comfortable underwater and I didn't realize that I had this skill that was above and beyond because I thought, well, most people should be able to do this. It's pretty easy. You know, it's my happy place. But then seeing all these other people who were like dying blowfish couldn't even hold their breath for 10 seconds under the water, I was like, oh, wow, like, this is really truly where I shine yeah. and I got the pictures back and they looked like the artwork that I've been creating my entire life. That gives me the shivers too. 
And so I realized that, yeah, I didn't need to spend 40 hours making an artwork. I could be my artwork and and live it. And so that's when I decided I'm going to make a tail again. And, you know, it might not be very good, I, but I made one when I was a kid and it was fun. And I was into costume design and performance and modeling and drawing and everything. So I thought, well, I've got some skills. I could probably make something half decent. And, you know, did some research development. I reached out to all the people online that had ever made a mermaid tail, um, which at that point was really just site-specific mermaid things like the Wikiwachi Springs. And I got to say their tails were not very good back then at all. So I didn't really find much inspiration there. And then there was um, Splash. And of course, there was a guy named um, Robert and he'd made the Splash tail. And he nicely wrote back to me, but his information was, you know, we had a huge team of prosthetic artists. We made, you know, 10 tails. She couldn't take them off for 10 hours once she'd put them on. We siliconed her into the latex, the men, you know, they got ruined each time. It was like, oh, wow, well, I can't do any of that. So I'm just basically going to make my own thing. And, uh... After much research and development, I kind of created this monofin and um, a, a wetsuit neoprene sleeve that went over it and decorated it up and did some shoots. And as soon as I saw what it looked like underwater, I was I was hooked. I was just like, this is no amazing. Pun yeah. <laughs> or intended. Yeah. So um, I kept getting better and I had some friends that helped me out um, and said, oh, you should use a polyethylene board and bolt the flipper feet to it and then shave it down and put some silicon and you know you know bit by bit I got better and better and I'd spend hours just painting the tails and then I found tiny little scales and now I hand sew each tiny little scale onto these things they take four to six months to create one tail and now I have silicon artists that will come and do the the extra decorative fins for me because I never got into silicon. Mm. Um, so it's like a collaborative affair now where I'm designing the whole thing and working with people to create these functional, amazing tails. And now I have 14 of them. And Do you have them um, here? I do, yes. Yeah. By the way, thank you for having us at your house of here course. in California. Yes, Appreciate it. where it's always sunny, yes. mermaids are happy. <laughs> <laughs> mermaids are happy. Um, so, wow, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot. Over 16, 17 years of being a mermaid. So I'm averaging about one a year. Do you have a favorite tale? Uh, usually my favorite's just the latest one that I've mm, made. That makes sense. Yeah. You're more but there's excited. some trusty tried and true ones. Some of them are better for underwater work if I've got to like keep up with an animal or you know some are more comfortable than others but then some of them are not very comfortable but look absolutely amazing so they're like my special photo shoot ones Mm. so each one has its own niche have you ever been uh really afraid of drowning or of any of the creatures you're interacting with or anything like that is that I was definitely more scared of the ocean and the creatures when I first started because I just didn't know as much and I've realized over 16 years of doing this there's really not much in the ocean that wants to hurt us Mm. even sharks are pretty much we're they're way more scared of us than we are of them and so once you realize that it's more just being about being aware um, and understanding and having respect for not touching things the wrong way or, you know, knowing the environment that you're in. Um, but I remember the first time I saw a stingray, it was like moved underneath me. And I, I was like, Jesus, I walked on water. I was out of there so fast Mm. screaming. Um, the first time I swam with great white sharks, I'd hardly even seen a normal shark by this stage, and I went straight into swimming in a mermaid tail in the open ocean with great white sharks in Mexico. And kind of insane, kind of crazy, but, you know, definitely one of my bravest moments. And So, okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold time out. <laughs> uh, a great white shark. Let's, white let's shark. go to the, the PR of anti-shark, where, you, you know, it's Jaws, mm. you know, being the biggest... Yeah, uh, great thought. white shark. Yeah. Um. So, so that was the point of why we decided to do this, because I was scared of sharks, and my friend, who is a really big shark advocate, came to me and he said, look, I trust so much that these sharks can tell the difference between you and dinner, even if you dress like a six-foot lure, that I feel safe enough putting you in the water. 
And I'm like, well, it's not your tail they're after. Are you sure about this? He's like, look, I've swum with these sharks for years, and I truly believe that they're intelligent, sentient beings. And I said, well, I will come, but I don't promise to get in the water until I'm comfortable. And he said, I don't want you to get in the water until you're 100% comfortable. We'll fly you across the world from Australia to Mexico. And, and you know, as soon as I got there and I looked down into this crystal blue water and I could just see these sharks just swimming around. They weren't like jaws. They weren't coming after anyone. There were people in a cage at the back of the boat and they were kind of like swimming off from the cage and swimming with these sharks and the sharks were just chilling and kind of like oh they would they kind of take off when the people would come in they were definitely more scared of us than vice versa so we had to be really careful not to scare them away and it just changed my whole perspective instantly and I thought I just I want to get in the water I can't wait what do you think happens when a shark does attack that what do you think goes through it I think um shark attacks are like 99% mistaken identity because they they, uh, hunt from underneath. So they're seeing silhouettes. So generally the most people that are attacked are surfers. And what they look like is an injured um, turtle, which is one of the main sources of food. Imagine the board and these little paddly fins or uh, a seal is their other main source. So if they're up on the surface and they're paddling around and they look injured and slow and a shark's hungry because we've eaten 90% of the large fish in the ocean, you know, there's a desperation as well of declining fish stock. So yeah, it's real. You'll, you'll also notice that when people are attacked by sharks, it's very rare that they will die. They'll usually get a bite. And that bite may take off a limb, which is obviously horrendous for us. But what's happening is a shark is like, oh, is that dinner? Oh, no, no, that's not. And that's why they don't get eaten. Unlike an alligator. (laughs) (laughs) They'll just go One too many shoes, friend. Not after you this time. (laughs) So what... um, the best thing you can do with sharks is to actually be down underneath and in their world with them Mm -hmm. and to be looking and interacting with them and showing them that you're not dinner, not acting like dinner. So when I was working with the tiger sharks, I was weighted to the bottom of the ocean, 30 foot down, and I was painted up kind of similar colors to the shark, like black and blue stripes. And I was able to like rub my fingers under their tummies and tickle their noses and interact with them. And and they saw me and I could see them and they knew 100% that I wasn't food source. And it was fascinating as well. The guys who worked on the boat down there, they said, we did a test because everyone's so freaked out about blood in the water. We were like, well, let's just see what happens if we put different types of blood. So they put cow blood in the water and the sharks were uninterested. They put human blood in the water. The sharks were not interested. They put fish blood in the water. They go crazy. And the reason is that uh, fish blood has a way higher oil content than any of the other mammals on land. And that's what they're looking for. That's, this activates their, this is food source Mm -hmm. mind. It's millions of years old. Right? Yeah, millions. That instinct. Of millions. Yep, yep. So they know what they're after. What's it like being that far underwater? Um, the first time I ever scuba dived, I got totally terrified, and I f- felt like everything was kind of closing in on me because I wasn't used to trying to breathe under there. And now it's just delightful. Like I don't go really, really deep. I'm not one of those people that needs to go a couple hundred feet down and, and like push my boundaries because all the photo shoots that we do, the higher you are up in the water column, the more color you get. The lower you go down, it just becomes like a murky blue. There's no light. It's not pretty. Right. So You're not an angler fish mermaid? No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a little headlight on? <laughs> so probably, mm-hmm. you know, the, the ultimate is around 30 foot is a good distance to be down because you can kind of get down to most of like the sandy bottoms of a lot of good places to dive and that's where a lot of coral reefs are and shipwrecks and things so yeah I and for me if I can like I can swim down on one breath to like 50 foot or so so if I can look back up and know that I can get up by myself I don't feel scared anymore you can see the light up ahead yeah up above you exactly 
I just, I'm trying to picture that and it's just, it's so hard. I think it's another when world. I'm in the bathtub <laughs> and that, that heaviness <laughs> that you feel in the bath sometimes, uh, I imagine that on, you know, the PSI of that, under I've that far. Just, I've, some people have talked about that pressure and I guess, I mean, I've only gone to maybe like a hundred foot down. I've never experienced feeling pressure on my body. Hmm. Um, I don't know if I'm just unusual or way, maybe... You're Atlantean. Yeah, maybe people don't really notice it until a bit deeper. But for me, what I'm experiencing is the weightlessness. Mm. Like we're 70% water and you're surrounded by water and you're weightless and you're floating. Like to me, that feels like freedom. That doesn't feel like pressure. And as a kid, I would have endless dreams of flying. And so this is the way that I can live out that fantasy as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Is it, or was it weird to adjust from having two legs when you're swimming, which is a propelling, I mean, obviously a tail is very propelling, but was that weird to be? I always swam like a mermaid. You did? (laughs) Yeah, so when I finally got a monofin on the end of my feet, and Mm -hmm. it wasn't until, you know, like I would, I would swim with my feet together with fins on and be able to swim like a mermaid but the first time I got a proper mono fin that had a huge fin I was like oh my god I've just felt like I I didn't have all of my appendages before and now I know how to do this right so, so it was freedom and it always felt really um splashy noisy and and not as streamlined to be kicking my legs separately mm-hmm so when you began your uh, your journey through being a cons- um, conservationist, mm-hmm. and uh, the first thing that pops in my brain, of course, is the cove, mm-hmm. which hopefully people will go and watch that if they yes, haven't seen it. Yes, please do watch Talk the about film, that a bit. The Cove. So I was working with um, my ex-partner, who's an amazing surfer in person, David Rostovich, and he started Surfers for Cetaceans, a group which was um, working to stop cetacean killing and capture and one of the Explain first what a cetacean is for people oh that yes don't know. a cetacean is all whales and dolphins and we had just swum with whales and had that incredible experience that i shared with you guys before and we thought well we got to do something we got to stand up for these amazing sentient beings and so we went to the cove in japan and it's where they kill twenty six thousand. Um, dolphins around Japan every year and uh, in a really horrifying manner horrifying. too it's not even a you couldn't even call it a sport I mean they just no they just corral corral them and then hack them to pieces and then they take out some of the babies and the cute ones for captivity to send around the world to places like SeaWorld and so forth, which is why we're really, really against cetaceans in captivity because they come from broken families where their families were murdered and they're ripped out of the ocean and These they're put in a tiny smart little tank. animals. They know their history. Oh, yeah. They are family oriented they always stay with their pod and then in in the wild they never ever hang out by themselves and they never swap pods like their pod is everything and so to take them out of their family and put them in a little round jail jail cell for the rest of their life it's torture um and so anyway we went to the cove and we there was six of us that paddled out into the bay of blood as they were doing the killing there was literally blood in the water. We could see the dolphins who'd been corralled off and they were spy hopping, putting their heads out of the water and looking at us and squealing. And it was like they were screaming, help us, help us. And there was nothing that we could do because the fishermen had um, blocked off, netted off the entire cove. There was nowhere we could like push them back out to sea. So we could just hold space and um, bring the media coverage and show people what was actually happening there. And the fishermen were so angry, they came and pushed their boat propellers up against us. They hit me with a big fishing stick and created a lot of bruising on my body. Uh, We knew that we only had about 15 minutes before the cops would be notified and arrive and so we'd had a plan that we'd leave but like around seven minute mark but once we got out there we just couldn't leave and we were sitting there just holding hands we actually had our passports taped in waterproof vests inside our wetsuits because we were expecting we would get arrested for uh, 
interfering with international commerce, which is what they call the charge over there, and they can hold you for 23 days in a Japanese cell without any reason, just before they even actually charge you with anything. So it was pretty heavy. Um, we were all there just kind of putting our lives on the line for these animals, and it was a really weird experience to experience that there were these people on one side that had no connection to nature, no connection to these animals to the point that they could just stab a baby dolphin and not feel like they were doing anything wrong. And then these other people around me who were literally putting their lives on the line to help these animals. And so it was on the one hand, the most depressing thing I've ever done. And on the other hand, the most enlivening thing. Um, but super upsetting. Like when I when we finally had to call it, we got pushed back by the fishermen and we swam back to shore and we all came in and we were just crying our eyes out. And then as we jumped in our van, the cops pulled up at the same time as we were leaving and we managed to get away like within seconds of getting arrested. And the best thing of the whole uh, project was that 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 footage was included in the Cove film, which won the Oscar award for best documentary in 2010. And it helped to get dolphin meat taken off the government funded school lunch program that was running in Japan. And uh, also off the supermarket shelves in Taiji itself. However, they're still doing that practice. They're still killing dolphins every year. Sea Shepherd's a really great organization that's been trying to you know, bring attention to an awareness to it every year. And also the amazing Rick O'Barry, who is our partner in, in that um, adventure as well, who saved Japan dolphins.org is a great organization that, you know, is Japan based, which I believe is really the only way it's going to change is if the Japanese people stand up and say, we don't want this anymore. And the weird thing is dolphin meat is not even a very um, revered delicacy or anything. People see it as very second-rate meat. They still like the old school people still like dolph uh, whale meat, but dolphin meat is considered kind of like second-rate whale meat, and there's not even a big market for it. So it it just seems ludicrous. A lot of it's going to waste and not even getting used. Um, well, I have a lot of listeners in Japan. Actually, fantastic. Well, so guys, please like educate yourselves there's a lot of mercury and heavy metal poisoning in the meat um, to the point where it's extremely dangerous for humans to consume so there's really no point to continue this practice and it's going to take it's going to take people from the inside just saying this is not a practice we want to support anymore because yeah. they you know it's hard for other nations to come in and tell them what to do Yes. As also, versa. stop eating tigers, please. Yes, stop eating all animals. I was reading. Are you vegan? Or? I'm vegan. Okay. Yeah, I've been vegetarian since birth, and I've been vegan for a while now. And I was reading an article about, as I'm sure you're aware, we have 12 years to basically save the entire planet from catastrophic ruin because of climate change, which has an effect over the entire ecosystem, um, especially the ocean. And. Uh, People were saying one of the best things we as individuals can do to make a change is to become vegan because the amount of resources that it's taking to fuel the meat industry and the amount of um, farmland that it takes is way, way higher than it takes to make grain and seeds. But then they might take away avocados and almonds. They take a lot of water too. <laughs> <laughs> so... If we what? took out all the meat, yeah. I think we'd be okay with some avocados and almonds. I, I was being facetious. <laughs> Don't take away my avocados and almonds. That's I all I eat. Actually, when I got to LA and I went to the grocery store to get snacks for the Airbnb and the avocados, I was like, oh my God. And not only are they plentiful, but they're actually ripe. And, yes. You know, in Nashville, you go to the grocery store, you have to plan ahead and get oh your avocados God. for... Yeah, There's that weeks. weird avocado sweet spot where yeah. it's not gone totally black and mm. it's not wet and sort of slimy yeah, and yeah. hard i don't know how to find that perfect moment it's it's, a, it's tough but here they're all just ready to go they're perfect it's avocado land. so <laughs> lovely it's one of my most favorite fruits in the Me whole world too. what is next for you with all of this stuff and wait before you get to that actually i want to ask a different question um let's talk statistics for a second um about the decimation of the sea. Mm. I think it's an important thing. I don't know that people really 
get it, how get it. dire it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, as I mentioned, we uh, have eaten 90% of the large fish in the ocean in the last 20 years. That's insane. It's insane. Like, just let that sink in for a minute. 90% of all the large fish. And the large fish uh, are very important because they're the ones that create the new fish. Little fish are going to take a long time to get to be big fish and often get killed along the way. So we're not only taking out the 90% that exists right now, we're taking out all the babies that they could have created. So it's going to be a long road to get back if we ever do manage to. Um, you know, we're 70% water. The ocean is 70% uh, of the planet itself. And 70% uh, of Earth's oxygen, air, breathable air, comes from the ocean. A lot of people think it comes mainly from the trees, but in fact, it comes from the ocean. So if we don't have a functional ocean that's able to create the oxygen through the, the process that it does, then we're going to start running out of air. Um, yeah, and, and the, the temperatures rising screw up the bat and beat. If it were happening over this, you know, a million years, right. it wouldn't be a big deal because the adaptation would be fine. Correct. But unfortunately, doing it in a one, two, three decades, the there's no adaptation. Right. So you get more red tides. Mm -hmm. You get more, uh, you know, the the fish and the, the the frogs. These all these creatures are dying off. Exactly. The plankton dying off. The Great Barrier Reef, mm. you know, one of it's the... It's horrendous. Yeah. Even in the 17 years that I've been doing this, there's places that I went to early on that were gorgeous, beautiful, glowing coral reefs. I go back and they're just white boneyards. I've yeah. been places where they're throwing bombs into the ocean, just like local fishermen. They do these fish bombs and the bomb basically goes in it decimates all the coral and kills all the fish. The fish float up to the surface and they just come and scoop all the fish. But then the whole ecosystem is killed as well. So there's It's so bizarre to me that we're people, so short sighted. That's exactly as you would say, that <laughs> short sightedness is is insane. Yeah. And, and of course the water is now getting to the, the point where as you mentioned before the mercury issue and mm, yeah stay away should, from yeah. all large fish if you have to eat fish i honestly suggest that you don't eat fish because they're finding um mercury and toxic levels yeah, in, in most fish mm -hmm. uh, in fact my dad when he was still alive he came to me and he said um Oh, I said to him, oh, you're eating quite a lot of sushi. You should probably be careful of your mercury levels. And he scoffed at me and said, I don't eat that much. And then a couple months later, he came back to me. He said, you know, I actually went to the doctor and got my mercury levels tested to prove you wrong so I could show you. And he said, they were actually high that my doctor said that I need to stop eating fish. So I've like reduced it down a whole lot and I don't eat big fish anymore. And so thanks, and mercury I guess. Pos uh, mercury poisoning is no joke. It's, oh, it's intense. It's, there's the, the mad as a hatter, right? That right. came from the haberdashers that used to use mercury when they were treating exactly. there. Exactly. And it made them insane. And I it's an autoimmune so yeah. thing so it's basically like if once that is in your system yes. everything else starts shutting down That's you're right. basically dealing with an autoimmune disease so i also recommend you listeners out there go go check out your mercury levels go mm. get a blood test um i used to eat sushi i don't anymore mm. um it wasn't because of mercury actually although that was that's a concern for me with ingesting fish in general mm. and yes i love fish i do i love the way it tastes but i'm also aware that it's not what it was when i was a right. five-year-old girl or exactly. whatever um that's the challenge we're facing is that things are shifting so fast that it's like but i i always did that but it's not the same anymore. It's not. In even a, a tomato doesn't smell like a tomato anymore. Yeah. You know, unless you're growing it We're yourself. We're even getting he heavy metals in a lot of the vegetables these right. days because of the soil. Yeah. yeah. It's an unfortunate reality. Yeah. We have um, overstayed our welcome, I yeah. think. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't have anywhere else to go, so yeah. we better figure it out. I quit eating sushi because I read a parasitology book, oh. and I was like, oh, no, oh, I'm nope. done with sushi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. All sorts of weird worms and parasites oh and things going on there. It freaked me out. It freaked me out so bad. Um, dolphins. Let's talk dolphins. Um, that you, you you told the, the cove story, which was horrifying. I can't, yeah. You probably still have nightmares over that. Yeah, I can't even intense. imagine what that was like. But 
Tell a happy dolphin story. Happy dolphin story. I once swam in a pod of 400 dolphins who were mating in Hawaii, and you could hear you every... I know! I didn't mean to! I just got swept up in it all. <laughs> I got four phone numbers. <laughs> they were so lovely. They were all just, like, twittering, and you could hear all of them squealing under the water, and they were just dancing with each other and swimming all around. It was magnificent. Um, I love dolphins. They're just truly, you can't be in the water with a dolphin and not be happy. I, yeah. I mean, dolphins maybe... saved my life once. <gasps> dolphins saved my ex-husband's life too. Really? Yeah. Tell me your story. <laughs> so I was staying in Mississippi with uh, my friend Diana at her dad's house. You know, she was divorced parents, whatever. And, uh, we, we were on, on the Gulf of Mexico basically. And, uh, you know, when you go out a little ways, so we went down one morning, uh, it was my bright idea. Let's get up at five in the morning we had the not I call it the not so fun island we had the fun island that back in the day they don't do this anymore because of exactly what you said that they mimicked seal and so they had to stop making this product uh, so these fun islands they had they they're clear on top and then silver on the bottom to reflect the sun and we're supposed to be the perfect way to get a tan or whatnot and I said all right Diana let's, I've got an idea we're gonna we took Folgers coffee cans that were empty because her dad had them you know in the garage or whatever we filled them with rocks and dirt. We tied them to our big toe. And in the morning, we went down to the beach and we sh stuck the can in the sand. And we were on the floaty thing. And we thought, oh, this is gonna be great. We fall right back asleep and we'll just get tan here on the edge of the water. It'll be awesome. Uh, well, we woke up around noon, judging by where the sun was. We were in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Oh my God. We'd floated out to sea. And the thing was still just hanging off your foot? No, there was no more. I mean, we, it was gone. <laughs> oh, it was, no. It was my bright idea. Did you see land at all? Bad idea. No, <gasps> couldn't see land. Terrifying. We were terrified. I How old were you? Uh, I was 14. Oh, and she was 15. Oh, my God. And uh, jumped. <laughs> I jumped in the water and held on, but I immediately got stung by a jellyfish. Oh, God. So I jumped this back going on from the bad thing. to worse. Oh, no, it was terrible. And I said to Diana, I was like, um,. We're we red as lobsters by now, too. I, 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 oh, yeah. Totally thirsty. Oh, no, it's ridiculous. Um, we, I said, we're not, not going to, we're, this is it. And first we cried, and then we started just laughing hysterically. <laughs> we were out there for quite a while with nobody in sight, um, no land. We had no idea which direction we were supposed to go. And then I said, Diana, is that a shark? And there was a shark. S Stop it. Circling. This is like that bad shark film that just came out. <laughs> oh, which one? <laughs> I don't know. There's, so There's many. been too many. I know. But so the shark was going around us, and then uh, there was also a dolphin, and it was bonking the, the shark, shark away from you. Yes, trying to, yeah. And mm. so the dolphin, I think, saved our lives. 100%. Yeah. So How the dolphin knew we weren't a seal, yes. obviously. Yep. So this is exactly what happened to my ex husband. He was surfing with another friend in the waves and first the friend was surfing and a shark came towards him and the dolphin t-boned the shark away yeah and then did the same thing to my husband just down the line yeah so it wasn't like a random occurrence it just happened once it was like the shark the dolphin was literally putting itself in harm's way right pushing it away which is what i think happened with us because it kept bonking at the shark until eventually the shark was wow. like fuck off and Wow. Left. And then eventually a fishing truck came, or truck, a fishing boat came along. I said truck because the trucks keep yeah. going by. A fishing boat came along and they were like, what are you little girls doing out here? And to your point, we were fried. I was, wow. I had a third degree sunburn. Um, it was so disgusting. But um, yeah. How and long he, were you out there? I mean, it must have been seven, eight hours. <gasps> yeah. And uh, so oh, he threw huge. us a line and, and I don't know, he wasn't allowed to let us come on board for some reason. That makes no sense. Yeah. So, well, maybe it's because they were a couple salty dogs and we were like 14 year old girls <laughs> or something and he just thought better of it. I don't know. And we were in bikinis and, oh you know, whatever. God. But regardless, he towed us back, right? And then to the point where we could see land and said, we can't go any further. We we're not allowed to cross wow, a certain yeah. point, but you can swim from here. And we're like, oh my God, thank you. Wow. That's my crazy story for that. Wow. You really did nearly die at sea. Yes. But the dolphin saved you. I know. It's amazing. And the shark didn't know better. So I won't criticize him he or her. 
you know, and I'm sure they thought that's why they stopped making that particular brand of mm-hmm. because they did. The yeah, sharks. it's dangerous being up on top, just floating around. Sure. It's, yeah. Yeah. So what's coming for you? What's in the grand ocean of the world? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm working on a long term project. It's called Tears of a Mermaid. And it's a documentary about all the behind the scenes adventures that I've had doing all these incredible things that I've uh, you know, I experienced over the last decade or so. So when I've swam with the tiger sharks, it's all of the challenges and the behind the scenes stuff and the injuries that I got and like all the preparation that goes into it, the planning. Another adventure that we had was with the manta rays, swimming with them underwater at midnight, bolted to the ocean floor. They're with, like my face. Oh, they're so cool. They're so beautiful. that I call them the ballerinas of the ocean. Because they're so beautiful. I can only hope to be as graceful as they are. But I always the, think they, they're, they're an alien They race. are, 100%. Absolutely. I have a story about them, too, but keep going. Yeah, so I was bolted to the ocean floor 30 foot down with 20 pounds of weight, and there was a huge swell. I'm being pushed back and forth onto these intense rocks. I've got... Uh, one foot kind of like in a harness to hold me down. I'm wearing this huge wedding gown that keeps kind of flopping up over my head and nearly drowning me. And then occasionally there were viper eels that were wrapping themselves around my legs. What's a viper eel? Just like a weird, really weird eel that's, you know, as it sounds, not very nice. Sounds evil. <laughs> sounds kind of evil. <laughs> I did, I Where's did. the unicorn eel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as soon, and we had these lights to illuminate the whole area because it's pitch black down there. It was scary, you know, and I don't have a face mask on. It's just dark and scary, right? But then finally the manta rays show up and they start dancing in these lights and they come so close I can literally tickle their bellies as they go past me. And all I can't see the videographers or anything. All I see are these like huge illuminated lights with aliens swimming through them as I dance back and forth in the in the the breeze of the underwater ocean. And it was truly like close encounters of a third kind. It was the most surreal experience I've ever had in my life. And from that we made a short film called Manta's Last Dance and it was shown at the United Nations Convention for International Trade on Endangered Species. And it helped to get uh, an 80% vote in favor of making manta rays protected for the first time. And that happened about five years ago. That's amazing. So, yeah, it was shown to all the delegates who were voting. Are sharks and dolphins going to end up having to be on that? Um, I mean, all of them have to be on it because they're all endangered at this point. But sharks um, are protected in certain, certain areas at the moment. Um, dolphins, there's still so many dolphins that they're not considered to be endangered, so they haven't put them on that list yet. The numbers of manta rays were getting so low, and they were so endangered because people were taking their gills and, like, shark fins for shark fin soup in the Asian countries so that they were able to be put on the endangered list. Yeah. But getting that actually implemented on a ground level. Because there's still poachers. And- yeah, there's heaps of small communities around the world that like haven't even heard of the rules and let alone give a crap to enforce them You know, when it's sort of their livelihood to kill these animals. So there's some really great programs. Um, this guy, Sean Heinrichs, that I've been working with on Tears of a Mermaid, and uh, he's been my underwater cinematographer and producer in all of the short films that we've done. He's going to remote communities and creating underwater films with the animals there and inviting especially the children and the fishermen to actually come under and see the animals and film them interacting. And then he sets up a massive cinema, like, you know, huge projection and everything in their tiny little town and makes a film of the, them interacting and showcasing how important these animals are to the ecoculture and, and to their continued survival as a race. And so changing their perception from the inside out, which is so effective and so awesome. Um, he runs Blue Sphere Foundation, which is a really great foundation if you guys are looking for something I'll to support. I'll put links for all of this yeah. stuff on HeyHumanPodcast.com so yeah. people can access Perfect. it really easily. So I'd tell you this crazy story. About manta rays? Yes. Cool. Uh, my friend Nancy Colton, who had uh, a farmhouse in Carnation, Washington, 
<clears throat> she invited my then boyfriend, Jess and I, to stay the night. We were going out of town. I can't remember if we were going on tour or if what, what we were doing, but um, so we went to stay the night there. She made dinner, she set us up. She had just moved into this farmhouse uh, not too long before that. And she put us upstairs in the, um, in like the A-frame part. The attic. Yeah, something. the attic -y part. So Jess and I laid out our sleeping bags on the floor and went to sleep that night. And sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to something. Something woke me. I'm truly trying to figure out how a manta ray is going to fit into this farmhouse story. <laughs> yeah. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. Yeah. Woke up. I know. I'm on my back on the floor in a sleeping bag. I woke up and over my head was no more ceiling. It was water. And it, it still gives me the shivers. What? It was water and just dozens of man rays, dozens of them. And I'm staring at them, I'm like, am I, am I asleep right now? I could see the room on the sides. What? But above me was like an ocean. Wow. And I was just like, oh. and it was so beautiful. Mm. And you could see the light dappling through. It was like being under the ocean. What? And I'm trying to wake up Jess, who won't wake up. I'm like, Jess, Jess, Jess. Yes, and then I just I was like, oh yeah, and then I fell asleep again. So in the morning, I came downstairs. And at the time, uh, her son was probably I may get the age wrong, but somewhere around tenish or something like that. I came downstairs for breakfast, and I'm remembering this moment I had. I'm thinking, God, that was the weirdest thing. And I sat down in the little cubby in her kitchen, and Nancy's cooking breakfast. And I said, I had the weirdest dream slash experience last night. It was so strange. I said, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I looked up at the ceiling. She goes, did you see the manta rays? What? And I was like, what? <laughs> and apparently her son had the same experience in that room. I want to go and sleep in that room. I know. <laughs> what? I know it. It's like a portal to Atlantis. Or something. <laughs> And it wouldn't, the fact that this kid knew about it, that I had had that You scene. didn't even have to say it. She knew what you were she talking about. She knew it, and yes. That is wild. Yeah. She also had a ghost lady that lived in that place, too. Wow, what a farmhouse. crazy farmhouse. Yeah. She didn't stay there, but she lived there for, for quite a while. But isn't it wow. nutty? And so, I, I don't know. I've always had sort of a, a soft spot for them anyway. Yeah. Have you actually swum with them? No. Go to Hawaii, Kona? do it okay it's a one of those bucket list moments that you i just, just and i think people think forever. that they're they're dangerous I so think. a lot of people do think they're dangerous because they, they get them, them with the spiky one yeah so stingray is the only ray that has a stinger that can kill you if it happens to like go right into your heart or something like what happened to steve Irwin. but literally you have to be right on top of a stingray scare the crap out of it and it actually sting you in exactly the wrong spot Right. Um, that was a freak accident. It was a him. total freak accident. Um, yes, you don't want to step on a stingray. It will, you know, accident. It's like a bee. You don't, you know, they're not trying to sting you, but if you endanger it, it will release a sting. Sure. Um, manta rays do not have any sting. Most of the dif other different types of rays, there's mobiles and eagle rays and all sorts of rays, they don't have stingers. They're really harmless, amazing, beautiful animals. They're so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And even stingrays, I've swum with stingrays all, and they're all over me and like I'm petting them. They're like flying over my head, smushing up along my body. Like stingrays are gorgeous too. You just yeah. don't scare them. Sure. <laughs> sure. I would argue you don't scare my dad in any other time. <laughs> Bad things could happen. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, Hannah, this has been awesome. Well, thank, thank you. you. Um, let everybody know the best way to find you on the um, internet. Super easy to find. Um, HannahMermaid.com is my website. Hannah Mermaid on Instagram and Facebook and all the things and yeah come check out i got a whole bunch of amazing videos of swimming with whales and dolphins and sharks and manta rays and stingrays and i just would love to share all of the the joy and excitement that i experience in the ocean with everybody so everyone loves these animals as much as i do it's beautiful thank Yay. you thank you thanks for listening everybody bye bye